Hi, everybody. I'm going to let everybody wander in and then in a few minutes we'll get started. <clears throat> All right, guys, about one more minute and we will get started. A couple more people are rolling in. Mark, good to see you. Good to see you, Jesse. Judy, I'm glad you could make it. I don't think you were able to attend a couple of the last meetings. And it looks like some people are having trouble connecting to audio. So. Hopefully their speakers are working. I don't feel great tonight, so don't anticipate my usual boisterousness. <laughs> the passion is still there though. Jesse, it's Susan here. Just letting you know I'm on. Sorry, you're not feeling well. Thanks, Susan. Glad to see you. I'm here. <clears throat> Tis the season. It's hard to work around sick people and not get sick. Uh, are you working a lot? Eh, yeah, the same. Too much. That is the true answer. Yeah, I know. William, I'm glad you could make it. I think your email said Bill, so you let us know whichever you prefer. We'll try and remember and call that. 
Hi, Marilyn. Thanks for um, talking with Corey today. I appreciate that about the tree program. And Audrey's here. Hi, Audrey. Is Denise on? Hey, Susan. Hey, Jesse. Hi. Hi, Maura. There's Denise. Hey. <clears throat> wow, the whole board's here. Jesse, is it elections tonight? It is. Okay. We're just one night behind the polls. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everybody's still talking election stuff today. Yeah. All right, guys, I have 701. So I want to welcome everybody to our November 2022 Wild Ones of the Southeastern PA chapter meeting. Uh, very excited to have you here. We've got lots to talk about. We have had two new members since our last meeting. One of those was just, I think, yesterday. So that's exciting. Uh, we're up to 144 now. That number is pretty fluid because we have members come and go, memberships expire. And I think especially around this time of year, it's hard to keep up with um, memberships and uh, those kind of expiring things with the holidays. So. Susan, I'm just going to put you on mute. I think I hear your, your clickety clacks, but okay. you don't Go ahead. Get that in case you want to talk. <laughs> um, let's see if my slides will progress now. I want to let you know who we all are. I'm Jesse. Uh, I'm the president of this chapter. You can reach me at wildonesofsepa at gmail.com. I do try and respond in a timely manner, but um, Sometimes that's hard. So be patient with me. I will get to you, I promise. Audrey is with us tonight, but Audrey is um, only going to be our vice president for one more month with our elections tonight. We need a new vice president. Um, our secretary and webmaster is Susan. She does our amazing newsletter. So if you've received that, she is the mastermind behind that. Um, her email is also there, so she tackles a lot of our uh, questions and, and problems also. Denise is our treasurer. She's keeping us in the, which the black is the good one, right? She's keeping us in the black. Um, Lindy's our membership chair. That spot is also being vacated as of tonight. And um, Marilyn is our board member and our trusted advisor comes up with great things for us to talk about and do and helps us with some of the projects that we have uh, to announce with you tonight. We're still looking for um, more members to provide more input for the chapter, make it the best that it can be. Our homeowners advising committee chair is a vacant position that could really help um, get more native plants in people's yards. Um, and then a community projects chair would do that on a bigger scale, like it sounds, in the community. These are all the ways you can find us. We have our YouTube channel. All of our meetings are recorded and um, uploaded onto that channel as soon as I am able to edit them and get to them. Uh, we have a website. Um, Instagram is spotty. Sometimes we do stuff on there, not often. And then um, our Facebook page has a lot of the updated information, we try and get stuff up there. These are our two new members for this month, Royers Ford and Phoenixville. Um, Phoenixville has a really strong member population. And I like to draw people's attention to that when we get new members so that you can reach out to those people and do some of those community projects together. And maybe using the resources that you find out about here or that we give you access to here, like the wholesale plants and things like that, and then do things in your communities. And then we're gonna hold on to our chapter business, our thoughts of the month and our tree of the month information and all of our upcoming um, opportunities for after Mark's project, because I'm so excited to hear about our native shrubs for four season interest. Mm -hmm. So I am going to stop sharing my screen so that Mark is able to share his. And Mark, I just wanted to let you know that this was one of the most um, highly requested links for a meeting. So I think people are, are 
ready to hear the information you have for us. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can you see my uh, my screen? Can you see yeah. the screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's right there. Yep. It's okay. Good. All right. Thanks for inviting me back. You guys are gluttons for uh, punishment. Um, I'm always excited to talk about native plants, especially things that are so important to the garden, the ecosystem, and wildlife as native shrubs. Um, the presentation tonight, uh, it will be on my website um, sometime tomorrow by noon, because um, I already saw one slide I got to correct, but I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to uh, dwell on it um, uh, before I get a chance to do that. Um, but they'll be on the website, so you go to the home page, click on the title of the presentation, either here or scrolling down, and this new page will open up, and here are some links that I am of um, related to what we were talking about tonight, some of which I will refer to during the presentation, and then um, by tomorrow noon, there will be a link here with a PDF of this presentation. Um, so tonight, we're talking about native shrubs. First, we're going to have um, a general introduction, then we'll talk specifically about gardening with shrubs in general, and then we'll get into specific um, shrubs for different landscape uses. So first off, what is a shrub? You know, a, a couple months ago, we talked about trees and we learned that, you know, both tree and shrub are a growth form or habit. Um, of woody plants, and it's not like a taxonomic group, you know, it's like a, not a whole separate like flowering, non-flowering plants, or, a, you know, genus like, you know, the rose genus or something like that. Um, woody plants can occur in, um, you know, both woody and herbaceous can occur within the same genus. And then, um, and then even, you know, both tree forms and um, shrub forms can occur in the same genus and even within the same species. The um, characteristics of a shrub is that it has this woody tissue. So we have this little diagram here. This is kind of important to keep in mind if you are ever, um, if you are ever like doing any kind of propagation from wood cuttings or pruning, <clears throat> the you know green wood is the new wood of that. Um, usually, it starts in the spring, and before it starts to thicken by the fall, and then in late fall and over the winter, it actually becomes woody, and that's what enables it to survive above ground. Um, you know, over the winter is specifically this um, lignified um, secondary xylem in here. Um, so. Uh, uh, what characterizes a shrub versus a tree is a shrub is usually has multiple stems. Here we see the same species of pagoda dogwood that here's the shrub form with multiple stems, usually shorter, 15 feet or less. And then the tree form has a single stem that we call like a trunk, a dominant um, central stem. And um, they're usually more than 15 feet high. Okay, so that's what a shrub was, but then what's a native plant? If we're talking about native um, shrubs, most of you probably know this, but there may be some um, people who are newer to the group or um, to native plants. So I'll just briefly cover that a native plant is a plant that either evolved or moved naturally into a given geographic area without human intervention. Um, generally, in the United States, um, that is considered to be uh, pre-Columbian. Part of it's because like our records, you know, really date our modern records date back to the colonial times. Um, but there were um, movements of plants by, um, by Native American peoples before um, European contact. And we're aware of that sometime, but we're more aware just because, you know, that's uh, basically Western history and Western um botanists who documented things. Um, so generally, you know, these plants are considered native if they were in a given area in the U.S. before, um, you know, 1492. Um, and the importance of that is that the, of the geography is that the um, geography on the regional and local scales drive the plant populations because within similar, within geographic areas where there are strong geographic boundaries, a lot of times we have uniform precipitation, temperature, 
length in um, day and the growing season, as well as all the different organisms above ground and below ground that plants interact with. There's usually sort of a consistency across ecoregions. For ecoregions vary from level one, which is the really large ones, like that would include say like most of the Northeast um, level all the way down to, I think like it goes down to like level five or something much smaller. But we use level three a lot of times because that's a manageable level um, for us to document plants. It otherwise just be so difficult if we try to get down to just documenting plants within each um, smaller area. But generally, you know, native plant is considered one that is native to your part of your ecoregion. And it's kind of easy to figure out. There's information. Um, I have a fact sheet on the frequently asked questions. Um, page of my website um, that explains some of the different resources. But a lot of times it's fairly easy to find out to look things up by county, which is basically your area of your ecoregion. And let's, okay. So just talking in general, you know, when we discuss the importance of plants and, you know, specifically native plants, just a quick understanding of um, how plants interact with the nutrient cycles and the energy cycles. Um, so as we know, the sun fuels, um, you know, this basically this vast engine uh, that is operated by green plants, chlorophyll plants that do, uh, conduct photosynthesis, that they pass this energy from the sun through photosynthesis up in sugars and then building blocks of amino proteins. The plants basically form these with nutrients, water, and carbon dioxide that they get from the air. Some things that they can synthesize their own food, what these higher level consumers cannot. So they pass all that up to the consumers. Um, the primary consumers being the direct herbivores. You know, a lot of times it's mostly insects. They have an outside impact. About 70% of terrestrial plants that are consumed by herbivores are consumed by insects. Um, so insects have this huge role in passing, um, you know, energy and nutrients up the food chain to the secondary, tertiary, and the, you know, the peak um, cons uh, consumers, which of course are humans. Then those break down eventually after death. Then they're broken down um, through detritivores, um, break them down into smaller components that then the decomposers break them back down into the essential nutrients that then recycle back up into different plants. So it's just this huge engine. So plants are so relevant to that. And these intersections with um, the herbivores, the primary consumers, and with the soil organisms, the decomposers that convert the nutrients to the kind of um, chemical form that the plants can utilize. Two super um, important um, interfaces in all of life on um, earth. Um, so, and then the plants, you know, are providing this to um, up the food chain. And then in return, they're getting other services from the wildlife, um, such as, you know, the, we breathe out the carbon dioxide, fertilizer, um, pollination services, seed dispersal, those are just some of them. But it's important to know, like, you know, so we're talking about these, all plants, whether they're native or non-native, provide some basic ecosystem services. However, native plants are much more important when it comes to interacting how they support wildlife. Because um, whereas all plants conduct some basic photosynthesis and contribute some nutri nutrient cycling um, and carbon cycling and water cycling, which the real importance of native plants gets to um, how they interact and uniquely support native wildlife. So these are all pictures from my property. Um, and I just kind of like, you know, we talked about how, um, you know, the insects eat so much plant material. Well, 90% of those herbiv herbivorous insects specialize in a particular family of plants, genus, or even down to the species. And I just really just, just struck me the last couple of years when I love caterpillars and just all these different um, caterpillars, uh, sphinx moth caterpillars that I've, you know, found on my property. These are just some of them. These are the ones that are like so closely associated with specific plants that they're named after them. You know, ash, laurel, Virginia creeper, and trumpet vine. Laurel, of course, includes more plants than just like laurel. It's um, like sassafras is in the laurel family too. Um, 
And it's not just caterpillars. There's a lot of emphasis now on caterpillars, um, thanks to the you know great work of Doug Tallamy. But it's not just caterpillars that have these unique relations. It's a variety of other insects, some of which are herbivores themselves, the primary consumers. Um, primary consumers also include not just eating the foliage, but also those that consume the um, pollen and the nectar that have like a lot of bees um, are specialists in a specific um, family or group of um, plants and their mouth parts are designed. I just love how these little bullet, bullet flower, flower resin bees just like snuggle up to, this is an American um, bellflower um, or tall bellflower. They just like snuggle right up right on there and, you know, so they can get right down to the um, nectar. So this plant evolved to be pollinated by this be and that be um, evolved to uh, you know to do that plant. Sorry, my mouse sometimes just like has a mind of its own. Um, and uh, also the um, you know it's also like even the woody parts of the plants. You know this uh, boring moth. Um, the uh, the caterpillars specialize in eating the stems of Euptorium borers. And even some birds are directly associated with plants. This is the myrtle warbler form of the yellow rumped warbler. And it's called the myrtle form. It used to be a separate species um, because of its affinity for um, Northern bayberry, um, which is in the myrtle family. Um, so their um, range, their winter range overlaps the winter range of um, uh, bayberry. Um, I actually like, um, you know, another unique thing about um, native plants is how they support biodiversity and they represent biodiversity. So it's not just what, how they contribute to wildlife or to the ecosystem. They also just sort of have this inherent um, value in themselves because every organism is um, unique, has its intrinsic value just um, that we might not understand um, because, you know, science, we only understand a small bit of um, not only of just like something as important as our own bodies in medicine, but, you know, but imagine all the resources we dump into understanding our own illnesses. And we can't even figure that out, much less things that are just so obscure, like which microorganism supports some plant out in the wild. But species would not have survived this long through evolution, all the competition, if they were not providing some sort of important ecosystem service whether it's um, to a, another um, living organism such as a wildlife or whether it's somehow like, you know, moderating the um, soil nutrients or chemistry of the soil. So we just don't understand all, but each species has intrinsic value. And so it's important to preserve each species. Um, and so biodiversity, which can be measured in all these different ways, um, also provokes resilience of the individual species and of the ecosystems because you have a diversity of things that can adapt to different circumstances. Um, and so that helps protect against some things that are going on um, threatening um, the environment right now, such as climate change. The more biodiversity we have, the greater resilience nature, and then in terms of ourselves, will have um, against some of these uh, these threats. And to me, every lost species represents a crack in life on planet Earth and how long will, how many cracks can it take before the whole thing falls apart? And I also think that the simplest way for homeowners to preserve biodiversity is to plant natives to your area. If everyone just planted <laughs> plants that were native to the area, that means all the plant species in the world would somehow be protected. If people all over the world planted what belonged in their area, then, you know, just right there, we'd be preserving biodiversity and the animals and other organisms that rely on that. But native plants are in peril um, through a lot of human activities, um, you know, so there's very few native, um, you know, like natural areas, especially in a heavily developed area like Southeast Pennsylvania. Um, and so, um, you know, here we have what is now a, such a large part, basically all those white areas are developed areas which are a lot of times these sterile um, yards. Um, so uh, every time we have like these non-native plants, especially these sort of monocultures, we are decreasing um, you know, that biodiversity and decreasing the area available to native plants. 
Um, so every native plant counts. And the more we can turn something like this into a natural plant community, the better the environment and um, you know human survival in the face of climate change will be. But that's not. Uh, some people want more immediate interest, or they may not be interested in so much in the like bigger picture stuff. So especially like if you're you know trying to explain things to people, there's also benefits to um, you know individual gardeners, native plants because they're adapted to the um, soils and the um, site conditions generally require less maintenance and um, don't need soil amendments or fertilizer. Um, and so that saves time and money. It also is, if we stick with native plants and aren't importing new non-natives, we're not introducing a lot of obnoxious weeds, pests, and diseases. Think of the damage that emerald ash borer did. Think of the damage that Japanese beetles do. We wouldn't have those if it weren't for some of this non-native trade or bringing in non-native plant materials. Um, so uh, that's one way to you know, save a lot of money. Billions of dollars are lost um, due to these in, um, invasive organisms um, uh, destroying uh, you know, crops and other um, resources. So um, you can also protect the natural world around you um, by removing um, invasive plants and uh, creating um, you know, native plant communities, helping protect them. And then also just another cool little thing is a lot of native plant nurseries are run by small businesses. So a lot of times you're helping your neighbors or people in your community and local jobs by um, supporting these small businesses. Okay, um, now that we know what shrubs are and native shrubs are, um, let's get a little look at how they grow naturally in um, Pennsylvania. Um, in Pennsylvania, you know, most of our area was large, mature um, forests, usually mixed hardwood trees with some, um, you know, with uh, some, um, you know, conifers, softwood trees. Um, so um, where there were shrubs naturally occurring, it is like often in these um, these uh, like the successional areas after the perennial grasses are starting to um, succeed over to um, you know forests, we get the shrubland stage in um, in the early woodland stage where it's mostly softwoods, and then later on towards like the hardwoods and mature forests. Then there where they become these real understory plants tolerating more shade. But a lot of times they're here in these shrub plants and at these edges. Um, where it's like they thrive in a lot of shrubs we'll see thrive in these partial shade conditions. So, um, the, or areas where they like are more permanent, where they like prefer things like full sun is where trees cannot grow. Things like steep slopes, poor or shallow soils or wet areas. So that's why a lot of the shrubs that prefer full sun grow in these like, you know, sort of less desirable conditions, which is kind of good because a lot of our, um, you know, areas around our homes, our problem areas are those types of um, areas. Shrubs are really important because they uh, um, provide abundant food and shelter for wildlife. And they're also a really important structural layer between the tree canopy and ground level vegetation at these edges, like, you know, kind of like leading down at the forest edge and within the woods itself, you know, because like it's much, you know, like when you watch birds out in the woods or insects, they're going back and forth, you know, from the ground up to the treetops and they're hopping along the vegetation. The bird seldom flies all the way from the top of the tree down to the bottom. It's usually working its way up, gathering food of one sort or another. Um, so they apply, um, shrubs provide a really important um, you know, structural component for nat native plant communities. So let's talk a little bit about gardening with native shrubs. So um, we know that, you know, we're going to be looking for things that are native to our local area of our ecosystem, but we also have to look at what's actually happening in our landscape. Because for instance, you know, there could be everything is, you know, like from a wetland plant that grows in our local area or like someplace that grows high and dry. But if we don't have those conditions on our property, that plant's not gonna do well. So these smaller areas are called microclimates and they're the climate you know, driven by a specific location and affected by things such as slope, shade, the soil type, 
you know, the amount of wind going through, you know, the heat coming off our house. That's a lot of times things that are like, um, you know, that are less cold tolerant, do better close to a house or a large mass, like a boulder or something where the radiant heat is creating this little microclimate um, or in larger areas, sometimes the cooling effects of water bodies. Um, so these microclimates can be quite large, like in, the, in an ecological system, going to be as large as something like a river corridor or a mountain slope. But within our yard, it can be quite small. Like, you know, I really notice, like, um, you know, when I'm working out in my woods, you know, there's a certain temperature there. And then when I walk out into the yard, there's this dramatic change. And during the day, you know, you go into the woods and it's cooler. Um, but then in the evening, the woods are actually warmer because they've captured some of that warm air from during the day. And so it, it's not as much, the temperature doesn't change over as quickly. So those are the kind of things that create these little microclimates. And that's sort of like embodied in this, like, you know, this rule of thumb of, you know, what the master gardeners call the right plant in the right place where we're looking at the amount of sunlight, the um, hardiness zone, cold tolerance, looking at the USDA zone map here for Pennsylvania, the soil pH, whether it's like alkaline or acidic or um, neutral or circumneutral, right around pH of seven, and then soil moisture, wet, moist, which is also called mesic or dry. And um, so this is really just kind of like a rule of thumb or a little shortcut for the preferred natural conditions of the plant. So when I'm considering a plant for my yard, I always try to look at its natural habitat. And is that the kind of habitat that I have in my yard or that would be naturally found here? Because my goal is to recreate the native plant communities that would have been found on my property if there were no like you know, human um, interference at all. So one resource I like to look at is um, the descriptions of local plant communities from the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And there are links and much more details about this in this fact sheet on my webpage, on the facts page of my webpage. And, you know, because I have a lot of sugar maples and they do very well on my property, um, and I love basswood trees and they do well on my property, I, you know, kind of patterning, this forest is in our area, um, I'm patterning my property on this sugar maple basswood forest. And here, you know, because of the trees, but we can also look at, since we're talking about shrubs, also describes what shrubs grow with those trees. So that, and then the, um, the herbivorous plants that go with that. So if you have like certain trees and you're wondering what shrubs to go with them, this is a good place to start. There are all different kinds of forests with a different, they're labeled, you know, by the, um, the major trees, the dominant trees in that forest. So there's all different kinds, you know, like oaks, hickories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, or if you're looking for a specific um, shrub, you can, you know, search the, it's a um, document that you can, is searchable. You can search for the name of that shrub, find out where it grows, and then some of the, um, you know, the herbaceous plants that might go with it. So that's a really good resource to look at, and like I said, you can find out more info on my website. Now, when we're planting shrubs on our site, you know, we've got the figured out which ones are the right ones for the right place, which ones like sun, part sun, you know, the dry soil, moist soil. So once we're narrowing it down, so we actually know which ones we want to um, consider planting, we have to figure out where to plant them and how to plant them. So we're, you know, always want to space all your plants for the mature size um, and when you're envisioning the future size of it, you try to think of at the mature size that you're going to have this continuous canopy of above of the branches and the leaves in a continuous root zone so that the soil organisms will have a really nice environment to live here and thrive and support the plants. And then the um, there'll be no bare soil that will dry out and um, and then uh, you know that um, these plants will just be able to interact with each other, and it's really good structure for wildlife. You know, this is more of a, a woodland type situation, but it's important to incorporate structures into shrublands, into herbaceous beds, everything. And generally, when we're doing our layouts, um, as far as habitat goes, 
these more round or blocky forms are, are provide the best habitat because within any given area, um, there are the most resources available to um, animal species, you know, from any given point in these sort of blocky shapes. However, a lot of us, especially with shrubs, we're, you know, doing them for privacy screens, hedgerows, windbreaks. Um, and so a lot of times we are planting more linear forms. Those can actually um, be really good for wildlife as far as like travel quarters. It's a really good safe way to um, travel from one habitat area to another. And when we do that, um, not just for the wildlife, but also for our own interests, like for the, the screening of something, whether it be noise, the sight line, like we want to block an, you know, an unsightly thing off our property, or whether it's to um, you know, block the wind or something. When we do these linear plantings, we want to zigzag the shrubs like this so that we're breaking, like say that, you know, you've got the wind blowing from here, it can get between these two shrubs, even when they're closer, when they're larger, there's still gonna be a little gap or less vegetation there, then they'll hit here. So when you are um, planting these hedgerows, you wanna try to have at least like this kind of a zigzag pattern so that um, once you're getting more plants in there, and then this would be the proper planting distance here. Say you're supposed to plant 10 feet apart. You're going 10 feet here, 10 feet here, and not like 10 feet between there and there. So these, the closest area is the planting distance. Um, and you want to um, also in all your plantings, use um, plantings with varied bloom times. Um, and fruiting times, you know, whether the fruit is seeds or berries, um, like bear um, seeds or berries. Um, and then uh, so that you can support wildlife for the longest period of time. And we talked about incorporating the importance of incorporating layered heights. Now, actually, how you physically plant them, it's very similar to what we talked about with planting trees. Um, you know, like a couple months ago, the difference being that um, shrubs don't really have like root flares. Um, you know, like a single trunk with like the roots at the top of a, you know, the uppermost root of a single trunk. Um, but they do have what's called a sort of like crowns, which is where the above ground structures, the stems meet the roots. So you really want that crown at, you know, soil level, the same as you want your root flare for a tree at soil level. The rest is pretty much the same as like planting for a tree, you know, you're spreading the roots out as much as they can, loosen up on the if a root ball, you know, loosen up root bound roots, root wash if you can, get rid of as much of the um, material that the pottings mix as you can. Use, you know, fill this space with native soil, don't amend it. You want those roots to be in native soil as soon as possible. So they'll adjust as soon as possible. And then, you know, you have the, um, the root ball resting on firm subsoil. You don't want it to sink down once you water it. Um, so things to remember then, you know, we, uh, you'll be mulching it. So in the mulch doesn't like, you know, like hit the, um, the stems, it's back a little bit and um, you're covering at least the area of disturbance. And for woody plants, you want to incorporate, make sure that you've got some woody material in there because the woody material, as it breaks down, is going to feed the mycorrhizal um, fungi that are associated with, um, with woody plants. They're looking for woody material as well. So you want to make sure you have some kind of woody material in your um, mulch. And so whether it's like hardwood, you know, root chips, ideally you're using arborist chips, um, but, you know, a mix of woody things and, you know, there can be some uh, leafy stuff in there too. But you want to make sure you have at least some woody uh, material in your mulch when you are mulching woody plants. Um, and other factors to consider, it's generally a good idea to have at least two different plants for the best cross-pollination. Um, and it's important to remember too, a lot of times, especially if you're buying cultivars and nativars and stuff, that a lot of times those are asexually propagated. So they're actually clones of the parent plant. So if you plant two 
of the you know clones like you go out and buy two exact same um like native hours they could have been cloned from this if they're from the same company if you bomb at the same place they probably were cloned from the same parent so they don't really have genetic diversity so your cross pollination is not going to be um better than it is just like you know from a single plant trying to you know self pollinate which they don't like to do so generally that's another reason that um you know, that straight species seed propagated are like, you know, better than um, native ours. And we also, you keep your eyes out for dioecious species that have separate male and female plants. You want to make sure that you have one of each if you're, you know, want fruit and seeds. And a neat little trick is that for shrubs, you can um, plant male and female individuals in the same hole because you really won't notice because shrubs you know, a lot of times just like grow so closely together with the multiple stems. If you start it when they're small, they'll grow in with each other and then you'll get super good um, cross pollinization. And sometimes you can even buy, um, you know, plants with male and female in the same um, pot. Another thing to remember is, you know, small shrubs do very well in containers. So if you're interested in container gardening or have a small space, you can use small shrubs. Once you got your shrubs um, planted, how you're going to care for them is, you know, water till they're well established. It's usually at least once, um, you know, uh, the first year, often up to three years, especially if there's any drought, you know, water them during drought or dry spells. Fewer deeper waterings instead of like, um, you know, uh, repeated shallow watering. So you want to water generally like once a week in the equivalent of an inch of uh, water that would cover the um, equal amount of the surface area. Um, maintain the ground covered. Nature doesn't like these bare ground, um, you know, because that can dry out the soil, can invite in um, like weed seeds and stuff. So you want to, when possible, the best um, covers for the ground, the best mulch is leaf, the natural leaf litter or living vegetation. If you don't have either of those, waiting for those to build up, especially if you're starting a new bed, then you definitely um, want to use the, the mulch that we talked about, um, you know, like two to four inches um, over any bare spots. And you maintain that throughout the, you know, just always, um, you know, in uh, these shrubby areas. No fertilizer or soil amendments should be necessary for native shrubs that are, um, you know, like established. And as far as pruning, if you do need to prune because they like to maintain size or for um, other reasons, you generally want to prune um, spring flowering shrubs because they are flowering on the wood from last year that um, survived over the winter. You want to wait for them to bloom and then prune them because you don't want to cut the wood off that's going to be producing the flowers for the pollinators and then the seeds and the fruit for other critters. And other plants that are not spring flowering shrubs, you um, prune in, um, in generally in late, late winter. There's a fact sheet on this, this on the page for this about like pruning shrubs. So you can get more details there. Now we're going to talk about some specific native shrubs for your landscape. First thing to look at is species. We talked a little bit about species and cultivars. Um, I'm not getting into this new, too, too much detail because there was just a talk on this last month. But I just wanted to highlight this, that we do know there is a difference. Generally, native plants are better, the straight species, than, um, you know, than cultivars. And certainly than non-natives because they support the, um, you know, they have more biodiversity, more genetic diversity, and they support the native wildlife um, better. And here's a specific example, um, you know, about the genetic diversity helps promote both that resilience, like we talked about. If everybody has the same cultivar of you know a popular plant and then a new pest or um, disease comes in all those cultivars have the same genes so they're going to be equally susceptible so if they're susceptible to that pest they're all going to be wiped out but if we have the genetic diversity of you know straight species all over the place then the chances of um, at least some of those plants being able to survive a new pest or disease are like, you know, greatly improved. So it's really good for that species. And they also support the wildlife more, you know, especially changes like leaf or petal color, the reproductive parts or the fruits um, decrease the benefit to the wildlife because the wildlife evolved with the specific plant parts that were in the native species. And the more we change them, the less palatable they are um, to wildlife. 
There are a bunch of invasive shrubs, just a list of some of them that you want to avoid. By definition, invasive shrubs are not native. And you may be wondering why we're not going to talk about some of these popular native shrubs, because they're actually not native to Pennsylvania. Whether you plant them is up to you, but the reason we're not talking about them tonight is because they're not native to Pennsylvania. Um, a few more thoughts before we begin. There are about 275 species of shrubs native to Pennsylvania. We obviously aren't talking about all of them. We're going to focus on plants um, with high wildlife value um, that, you know, based upon my experience that like grow well in my yard um, or, uh, you know, that um, I've heard like my friends talk about. Um, I've organized this by, and also their availability, you know, like you can think some shrubs great, but if you can't buy it, you know, then it's really not great to get everybody's hopes up. Um, and then I organize by landscaping use as opposed to just like, you know, with the trees or just, you know, like kind of going through by genus. Um, these are organized by landscaping use. The way that we get like questions a lot is master gardeners or like at nurseries and stuff, people come up, I need a shrub for this, what do you recommend? That's how we're organizing it. And after I did this presentation, I came across this great resource that I have linked on this page, um, landscape use for Northeast native shrubs. And it's, you know, it was great to actually this kind of confirmation that I like included a lot of, you know, the shrubs that they also include, there's a huge overlap in the, you know, the species. So this is a great resource that's linked on there that kind of has this cross-reference cross for the different uses and the different site conditions. It's a two-page thing, and there's the link on my um, site. Um, so the... Uh, we're focusing on the optimal conditions, you know, especially in so, um, but most plants tolerate a range of conditions. The more you push them, the chances are they're going to need a little bit more coddling. The more you stick with a shrub that is suitable for the, that specific conditions, the closer to the preferred conditions, the better it's going to do. And a lot of shrubs will not flower as well in shade. Um, as they do in the fall sun, and some of them might grow spindly or to a tree form. This has happened with some of my American witch hazels. When I planted them originally, like they were surrounded by smaller trees, and they had this nice bushy form. Now that the trees have grown taller to, in order to compete for the sunlight, they, some of these have actually developed into small trees and just have a single wider trunk now. So they actually went from shrub to a tree form, um, you know, in order to compete successfully in a shady area. Few more thoughts. We hear a lot about keystone species today, um, you know, and a, a keystone species, th th that concept's been around for decades in ecology. Um, it's a plant I call it like punching above its weight. It provides um, a just proportionately large effect compared to its biomass, the way it supports other wildlife or ecosystem functions. It's not just the wildlife, it's all those ecosystem functions that we um, talked about earlier. Um, but a lot of times keystone plants are used in a specific, specific way. Like a lot of times now when people talk about keystone plants, they mean that they support like um, herbivorous, herbivorous insects, especially caterpillars. Sometimes though, it can be keystone plants for pollinators or keystone plants for birds. So it's important to realize if you hear keystone, what exactly are they talking about? And is that what you're trying to do on your property or is that your goal? But as I mentioned before, all native plants have some benefits, um, whether or not they've currently identified as keystone. And as our understanding of nature evolves, we'll probably be redefining some of these things anyway. Um, all shrubs provide some shelter um, and nesting sites for wildlife. So we really don't talk about that much as we're going through it. When I talk about high wildlife value, you know, which is food, water, shelter, nesting sites, um, uh, those are the, the basic ways that plants support wildlife. And so since practically all of them provide shelter and nesting sites, we're not going to talk about that that much. When we hear about plants supporting pollinators, usually means flying insect pollinators. It overlooks things like beetles and ants. And, and sometimes it's even like, you know, they don't even talk that much about like flies or midges or mosquitoes that also can, you know, can pollinate plants. But usually pollinator friendly plants means these uh you know, bees and butterflies and moths um, and wasps. Um, so deer resistant, as you know, is not deer proof. Um, so, you know, take a, with a grain of salt, anything that's, uh, you know, marked as deer resistant, because a lot of times that's the mature 
tough foliage that the deer don't like, but they'll eat it when it's tender. They'll eat the shoots, they'll eat the blossoms, the buds, you know, so just take all that deer resistant stuff with a grain of salt. And again, make sure you're getting the native species. Like sometimes people say, oh, I've heard that viburnums are like really great, but make sure you're getting a native viburnum, you know, so in the use of botanical names. Now we did talk about four season interest. This was, you know, I actually changed the name of the uh, presentation subset, you know, uh, you know, like uh, a couple months ago and forgot to notify Jesse, um, you know, so, uh, so, but speaking of, you know, four season interest, um, you know, there's the interest to the people and the interest to the, um, to wildlife. So all native shrubs, you know, has certainly have four season interest to wildlife and many of them have four season interest to people also. Um, and so we're talking about four seasons and interest. Generally, when we think of it, like in human terms, we're thinking of spring flowering shrubs, you know, for the beauty and fragrance. They also have this important access for wildlife. The pollen, the nectar, the blossom themselves, some birds and insects, I mean, eat the blossoms, the whole blossom or just the petals. Um, and then the insects that are attracted to that, the birds are eating the insects that are attracted to the pollen. During the summer, it's primarily a season of foliage, early summer fruits and flowers. And we're looking at that in our terms for privacy, shade, beauty, snacks from the, um, the fruit. Birds, the interest of wildlife, a lot of them are nesting during this time. So they're looking for food and shelter and nest sites and um, water. They get water from the foliage um, itself. That sometimes they, they drink the water off the leaves like raindrops and stuff, or they bathe in the water on the foliage. Um, so these um, plants are important um, sources of water um, for wildlife, um, you know, when they, during the uh, summer months. In the fall, um, the, uh, we're looking at color for foliage and, you know, like late uh, in fall fruit, um, you know, we're looking for beauty again from the beautiful fall foliage and for snacks from the fruit. Birds are also looking for, you know, looking for food and shelter primarily. Had to get a picture of a warbler in somewhere. And so this magnolia or warbler was hanging out in my yard, um, you know, this fall hunting down here in the Allegheny blackberries, um, you know, with their beautiful fall color and picking insects off. We don't think of these as being like, you know, necessarily like that, it, you know, insects during the fall, but, you know, they insects are hiding there, feeding on there, and birds are hunting there, important migrating resource for, um, you know, birds, uh, resource for migrating birds. During the winter, you know, bark and, um, you know, the stems, evergreen foliage and fruit were again, primarily consourced with the looks during um, winter, the beauty by winter interest. That's usually what we're talking about. Plant uh, animals are using these for shelter, um, for food, like fruit that persists over the winter, like these rose hips. And also, you know, for, um, you know, for water that's trapped by the, uh, the plant um, and from the plant parts. So I will talk about some specific um, individual plants. Um, you know, there are a lot of, I, you know, I'm going to kind of go over this fairly quickly um, because this list is here for you to look at. And, you know, I'm not sure what each one individual, what your site conditions are, but just so you get an idea of what's available. Evergreen shrubs, you know, the inkberries, one of the, um, you know, a native evergreen shrub here. And I just want to show you what we described. So we have the heights here. Flowering time for all the plants, flowering time, the fruit, um, fruiting time, the fruit time, um, the weather, you know, the fall color in this case, it's an evergreen, what its growing conditions are. And we talked about, you know, um, you know, how things are times in shade, they don't bloom as well, or they grow a little bit spindlier. The soil conditions, preferred soil conditions, the soil types, um, and the pH levels. And this is what I really like to look at, like I mentioned before, the habitat. So I just, you know, included the habitat for all these also. So you could see where they occur naturally. So when you're like thinking, where am I gonna plant this on my property? This is what you can be looking for. Do keep in mind that a lot of cultivars, if you're planting cultivars may not, you know, like they may be a little bit more tolerant of average site conditions, like of home, you know, cause they're bred to do well in home gardens. So they may not do, you know, as well in some of these areas as the straight species. So all these descriptions are for the straight species. 
wildlife value, um, the known wildlife value, and anything else that might be of um, interest to us. Um, you know, so most cultivars are female. That should actually be um, dioecious there. And so I'm going to have to um, change that because it's uh, got separate um, male and female um, plants. Um, and so, uh, so we'll be, um, you know, that's kind of information for each one. So other evergreen things are our native juniper is the short um, one, um, the uh, verdepressa, which is different from horizontalis. Um, mountain laurel, the state, um, you know, the state uh, plant here, our state flower. Um, this is one that probably really is um, deer resistant because it, the foliage is poisonous to hoofed browsers. Um, I have a really difficult time establishing this. I've tried several times. I, a lot of people I talk to say it can be difficult to establish. Other people, it grows well. So do be, um, you know, um, you know, be aware of that. So I'm going out and buying like 20 of these. You may want to try one or two and see how they do on your site before you actually get a bunch of them. Another beautiful evergreen is our native rhododendron. In this case, using rhododendron in the way in the vernacular or lichen, so because rhododendrons and the genus includes azaleas as well. This our um, rose bay is actually evergreen. Most of our um, azaleas are deciduous; they drop their leaves during the winter. But this the rose bay does have evergreen. It can form a big, beautiful um, screen or shrub. Um, and I found that these are doing well in my property, sort of at the forest edge. Um, so they seem to like that partial shade here. And, you know, um, moist, um, once they're established, they'll tolerate some drier, but they generally like these um, cool, moist um, conditions. And when we see well-drained, it means that we don't want the soil wet for too long. So even sometimes we see it for moist or wet soils, and it means it's okay if they get moist or wet, as long as it doesn't sit. Shrubs for screens. Um, this is another people um, to ask for a lot. A lot of the times these are characterized as being tall and having dense stems and foliage. This I think is one of the best deciduous shrubs for screens. The um, calicanthus. Um, the, I would compare this, like you know, as um, when you think see how a lot of people have used for scythia for um, screens, where just like super thick stems and super thick foliage, you just do not see through that when it's in full leaf. Um, that is the kind of thickness this has. That's lower in you know like wildlife value um, than some of the other plants. But birds do eat the seeds. I've seen them pecking open those hard seed pods to get to them during the winter. So it's actually a good winter source of seed. Um, and it is pollinated by beetles mostly, as opposed to like, you know, butterflies and bees and stuff. And it is deer resistant too. This is another one I seldom see get any deer damage to. Um, so you, you may want to, they do need a little bit of pampering to get established, but once they're established, they're like really, um, you know, really hardy and they're just a great screen. Witch hazel is one of my favorite plants. It's just so beautiful this time of year when the, the, um, you know, the flowers are blooming at the same time that the leaves are, have color. Um, so this is another great plant to use. It can grow fairly tall. And also, it's not as dense as calicanthus, but it does form a good screen. Um, here we have, you know, the um, the American elders are elderberries. These are fast growers. They spread like crazy. They spread through rhizomes. They spread by seeds. When people want insta screen, insta plant screen, or insta hedge. A lot of times they are including elderberries because they grow so fast and pretty thickly. And then you have these great flowers for pollinators. And then the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the fruit for the birds. All these pictures of wildlife enjoying that are from my property. So that's why I kind of, you know, may not be the species that you associate with this or there are probably a lot of cat birds, but you know, I want to have real world experience could do, so you could see that this stuff really helps. Um, and these also seem to be pretty deer resistant. Um, let's see. 
blueberries. Everybody should have blueberries, you know, because one thing you want to eat blueberries, they're pretty easy to grow if your soils are somewhat acidic. A lot of the cultivars don't require as much um, the, the acidity as much as the straight species. Beautiful fall color, you don't, um, you know, that a lot of people may not think about. Um, and so, um, so they're just a really great shrub to have. I find that they require very little care. It's popping in the ground, you know, getting past that first year and they do really well. Um, and, you know, enjoy the, the, um, the berries and the beautiful foliage. Um, all the viburnums are, you know, like great in particular, um, when we talk about hedges, um, arrowwood viburnum grows pretty tall and pretty dense. So that's a great um, hedge. Shrubs for foundation, we're looking at usually shorter shrubs that tolerate drier soils. Chokeberry is a great shrub for this. What's really nice about that is the open airy habit that for, um, forms this light shade that it's easy to grow things under, you know, things like who grows and, you know, um, your uh, herbaceous plants that like, you know, that part shade. This is a really great way to get part shade in an area, you know, that's sort of on the lighter side, beautiful fall color, um, you know, great for pollinators, for caterpillars, and of course, for the um, berries for the birds. New Jersey tea is a beautiful little shrub, you know, good for pollinators, great flowers, really pretty. Do be aware that it is rabbit fodder. Um, so if there's a rabbit within five miles, it's gonna find us. So you do wanna make sure that you protect them from rabbits. This is one of the plants that they seem to just seek out and you know eat as much as they can. So do protect them from rabbits um, until they're big enough not to be damaged, which is, has to be pretty big. Um, but these are really great little um, shrubs for these, um, you know, these dry um, shade to part shady areas. A beautiful, another little beautiful plant, similar site conditions is um, Contonia. This is grown primarily uh, sweet corn for its beautiful foliage um, and the, um, and, you know, which is also, you know, fragrant. Uh, this plant for sunnier areas um, and stuff says sun part shade to shade. I find that it flowers best and does best like in um, full to part sun um, is the shrubby St. John words. Also super attractive to pollinators has a long bloom period also. Low bush blueberry has the same, um, you know, benefits as the high bush, except it's much lower and tolerates drier areas in, um, you know, more sun. Um, so another beautiful uh, plant for foundations. Plants for wet spots um, include smooth alder, which is um, in the, uh, the birch family. And so it attracts a lot of the same insects as the, um, you know, birches do has really dense, strong branches that birds like to nest in. It is a nitrogen fixer, so it will actually help improve barren soils for, um, you know, later on to then plant with things that want richer soils. And it does tolerate flooding, forms thickets. So this has very attractive foliage and inconspicuous um, flowers. Button bush is a pollinator magnet covered with these ball-shaped flowers, it attracts so many different pollinators, it is one of the top pollinator plants, I think. Um, and birds love the seeds um, too, and dense um, habit for nesting and shelter. So that's a really good shrub to get in your yard if you have a sunny, wet area. Um, Clethera, um, sweet pepper bush, you know, a lot of us are probably familiar with that. Beautiful, wonderful fragrance. Um, sun to part sun, beautiful fall color too. Um, a lot of different um, cultivars, dwarf, but you know, if you're gonna concern about dwarf, a lot of these, you know, dwarf cultivars grow taller than you think anyway, you're gonna end up pruning them. So you might as well get the straight species and then just like prune that, um, unless, you know, you're really like putting in a container or something. Um, but if you're playing it out in the bed and you just want it short, I think I would just soon go with the straight species for most of these and then just prune them. Um, several different um, dogwood species. Here's a table comparing their different attributes. These are wonderful high wildlife value for pollinators, berries for animals, for birds and stuff, and beautiful fall colors. And they tolerate a wide range of conditions 
soil moisture, and you know, sun to shade. Winterberry, every garden I think should have winterberry also, you know, for the really, really important sources for birds. Just saw this hermit thrush hanging around mine just this last couple of weeks. So that was a real delight. The, again, they on this is how you identify the male and the female flowers. You look for the active anthers here on the male and for the um, active pistils here on the females. All our native roses are wonderful. This one, we're talking about wet soils. Swamp rose grows there, green. All this different interests, important hips um, for winter food. And so other native roses um, do better with um, in drier soils. Our native roses are much more resistant to rose rosette disease also than the, um, you know, than non-native roses. So I wouldn't really worry. I haven't seen any rose, rose rosette on my native roses. Um, and they actually host the thrips that then are helping wipe out the multiflorose. Um, so that's another reason to plant them. They'll actually help you get rid of multiflora. Swamp azalea, one of my favorite uh, plants that likes the wet areas too. Very fragrant flowers, beautiful white flowers. Another viburnum is, you know, um, viburnum nudum, wither rod. Um, so that's another one to consider the beautiful multicolored berries from pink to blue. Beautiful glossy leaves that turn burgundy in the fall. And you're going the wrong way there. Shrubs for shade. Um, American hazelnut, just tell you this, attracts deer and squirrels like crazy for the nuts. So do be aware of that, that you'll have to like probably protect those from deer and squirrels. The northern bush honeysuckle, this is not related to the invasive um, bush honeysuckles. This is not a true Lunisra, it's Diervola. Um, that does well in shade and dry shade. So something to remember, and it does have pretty fall color and pretty um, yellow flowers in the spring. Um, smooth hydrangea is a great one for shade also. Um, you know, this does very well in, you know, part shade or light shade, even if it doesn't get direct sun. It will get a little bit leggy and heavy shade. Um, and it does well in, um, you know, some of these drier uh, conditions also. And they're really attractive to, um, you know, to pollinators. Also, um, they, you know, like as we know, these are the, the showy flowers are the, um, are sterile flowers that have a lot of, um, you know, that have showy petals. And it's these central flowers without petals that have the fertile, um, like provide the nectar and the pollen for the insects. Northern spice bush, uh, another really beautiful plant with the spring yellow flowers with light, light airy habit, and then important fruit in yellow fall color as well. And of course, spice bush swallowtail is associated with that. And I didn't know, it, didn't know until this summer that they pollinate Turks caps lilies. Coral berry um, is a great plant like for spreading. See how this spreads? Just forms these great low colonies of arching stems, um, you know, in these sort of like dry to moist shady areas. So that's a really great um, little plant to have. Berries for the birds in the winter. Maple leaf viburnum, all the benefits of the other viburnums. Azalea, similar to the, um, you know, the rhododendron, those same benefits. It is a rhododendron. So that was it. We'll just summarize quickly. Um, every native plant helps, you know, more native plants, the better. Um, native plants provide a wide range of benefits for people, animals, and the ecosystems. And there's a native shrub for every landscape, you know, especially for years and your site conditions. And they provide these wonderful four season interests from spring to fall. And here are some good resources. I have those U um, Connecticut fact sheets linked on my webpage. I also like to use the Audubon Native Plants database. You can sort by a lot of things like, you know, type in your zip code, sort by shrub, and it gives you a list, both a comprehensive list and then recommended ones, ones that are really easy to grow in home gardens. So that's kind of my favorite of those zip code databases. Um, this is a really good book, Essential Native Trees and Shrubs for the Eastern United States. Um, here, what I really like about this too, is it lists like companion plants. So it talks about like which that occur like out in the wild. So it'll tell you like which herbaceous plants 
grow with which trees and shrubs or which you know shrubs grow with which trees so it's really neat to help you kind of plan a whole little plant community um, by giving those companion plants and this is sort of a classic the um, native trees shrubs and vines what's really nice about this also is that it includes a lot of growing tips and propagation tips um, you know so this is also another really good resource and with that, we'll open up to if we have any questions. I don't know if I want to handle questions. If I don't know if people are using chat or you just want to ask them or what. If anybody would like to open their mic, you're welcome to and just ask Mark directly. If you want to put it in the chat, I can ask for you. Um, Mark, I just had a quick question. Um, the sweet fern, is that a true fern? Um, I missed the, uh, you know, the additional info on the slide, but. Yeah, yeah, no, it is not a true fern. And, you know, the copy of this presentation is on my website. No, it is mm -hmm. not a true fern. Okay. Um, and so it is a shrub, a woody plant. And um, it has like in um, it has like sort of like uh, cat can type flowers. Um, it, so it's grown primarily for its beautiful foliage, and it does colonize nicely. Um, spreads, forms nice little colonies, and stays very neat looking. Just like about maybe three feet tall. So it's a really nice little shrub for the textural interest. It's beautiful. I've never never seen it. Never heard of it. It's so pretty. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. It's it's in, it's getting a little bit easier to find in the trade. A few years ago when I got mine, it was, you know, it was, I didn't, really didn't see it that much, but now it's like really popping up at a lot of, especially native plant places. Um, it's, and fragrant. Native, it's very fragrant too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It really has nice. nice. Yeah, yeah. That's where it gets the name sweet fern is because the foliage has that nice sweet smell to it. I've tried transplanting mine and it's got an amazing deep and extensive root system. Oh, wow. So, wow. Yeah, Good I would know. say it does transplant. I've done it, but you need to dig deep and um, pamper the baby when you transplant it. But it seems to work. Oh, okay. Thanks. Which is nice. Yeah, it's yeah. a good spreader and uh, it's nice to be able to move it around a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's good to know. Thanks. Mm. Mark, I have a question about soil um, amendments. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that you don't you don't really recommend amending soil, but what if I'm planting um, calmia, um, rhododendron, which, which really likes an acid soil. And I know from pH testing my soil that I just have plain old six to seven soil. Can I still have those, you know, calmia, bearberry, the acid lovers and use holytone on them or what are your thoughts? You certainly can. What you plant in your yard is kind of like your business, um, you know, but the idea, you know, part of the, you know, the philosophy around planting native plants is to grow what grows naturally in your area. And so the more you amend the soil, you know, then obviously that plant probably wasn't growing there. And if you're trying to, um, you know, to grow plants that wouldn't otherwise grow there, um, you know, and so then, um, you know, and then, you know, when we talk about um, benefits of wildlife and stuff, um, you know, if that plant doesn't naturally occur in your area, there may not be the wildlife that looking for that, you know, so the wildlife that are coming to your area are looking for the plants that grow in that area. So that's another reason it's better. But of course, you know, if, if you know, if you just have your heart set on that, and you know, it's a beautiful plant, and it really brings you joy, you know, you should go for it. When when I grow plants that I don't think are, you know, I always grow native plants, of course, and try to get them as close as possible. But whenever I'm naughty and plant a plant, I think of that as one of my like non-native plants. Since I have something from Asia, you know, I'm planting like a like a, a native plant that's just like native from somewhere else within my, um, you know, within my eco region, but isn't necessarily native to my area. So, you know, the the more you can get to native plants that are you know, unique to your area or that, you know, would grow naturally in your area, the better, but certainly, um, you know, your gardening also has to bring you happiness and joy or you're not going to be doing it. So, you know, it, it's really kind of like up to you. Yeah. Cause I think I would miss, you know, I, I have a hemlock and mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, 40 feet tall now. So my hemlock is my little acid zone area yeah. and under him, I feel like I can put, um, 
you know, bearberry, which I can't grow anywhere else. Yeah. And I just keep the whole area mulched with a lot of pine needles and try mm -hmm. to focus the acidic soil uh, uh, needles there. That's um, a really good right, point. I miss that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point because when you are going to amend soils, you you know, if one thing, it, you know, you always, you're going to have to, you know, amend them until the, well, as long as the plants are there. So then, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but it, it's a good point to, if you are going to amend soils, you plant, you know, the all the plants, get them as close together in that one area. So you're amending as few soils as possible. Um, the flip side of that being, you know, because we're talking then about like planting plants in areas. So you are concentrating the non-native plants in one area because the best thing to do when you're planting native plants is to try to have all your, you know, like don't just scatter native plants with non-natives, try to concentrate your native plants together. So you're creating these pockets of prime habitat because our woodlands have so jeopardized now, like our natural areas are 37% non-native. So there is so mm -hmm. much mediocre habitat out there. We don't need to be creating more mediocre habitat in our yards. So the more we can concentrate our native plants together, and conversely, concentrate our non-native plants together, the more we are creating high quality habitat, which has greater wildlife value. Okay. And so if, if I have Eastern red cedars seeding in on their own, which I do, mm -hmm. I can consider that area as maybe one of my acid soil areas. And I can go ahead and introduce um, a mountain laurel, rhododendron, things like that, because I think the soil must be acidic or the cedar wouldn't live there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you know, if you're really concerned about that, because remember, a lot of these things have, um, you know, wide range. And, you know, actually, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but there's this huge controversy, you know, in science, whether P soil pH really makes that big of a difference. Um, oh, good. But, yeah, <laughs> okay. no, there really is. If, if you read some of the okay. research on it, you know, it's, you know, we take it for granted. And so, um, you know, certainly like as master gardeners and just hear about it so much you know, about soil pH, soil pH, soil pH. But, you know, it's again thing where, um, you know, the actual science behind it is a little bit dicey. So it's based more like on observation because the plants mm -hmm. also affect the pH within their root zone. Their exudates and everything, they increase the pH in their immediate root zone. So it's a little bit unclear, you know, these pH soil tests, whether that is, you know, the pH of the soil as it's been um, affected by the roots already, or whether it's the ambient soil pH. And so uh, that uh, hasn't been totally studied, but there are plenty of reputable scientists who just question the whole thing of how important pH is, um, you know, to actual plant success. Um, you know, so I just want to put that out there. So if something is growing that normally tolerates acid soils, it could um, just be that that plant really doesn't require acid soils like we thought it did. You know, it just typically grows there because maybe other things don't plant there. Maybe that, you know, Easter red cedars are pioneer species. So they're going into poor soils, which are often acidic, but they may like other poor quality soils, or they may just be able to take over that kind of area that other plants are, are a bit fussy or can't. Yeah, I think that's definitely true of Eastern red cedar because they'll just pop up everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Whereas something like blueberry, I think I'd read that the acidity of the soil is what unlocks the blueberry's ability to pull nutrients out of the soil. Yep, yep. So yeah, yeah. It, it's much more picky. Well, all plants, I mean, soil pH is the primary driver behind the, um, you know, whether it's acidic or alkaline. Um, the soil pH affects the, um, the chemical form of the nutrients, which affects how the plants absorb it. So that's right, why soil pH ions. is important. Yeah, so whether it's alkaline, acidic, or circumneutral, the, um, the pH is affecting the type of um, molecule of that nutrient that's available to the plants. Yeah, and I think some plant roots, like you said, might be able to rejigger the ions on their own and others mm -hmm. just can't. And if it's right. not done for them, they are not gonna grow there. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah, that's, yeah, a, yeah. that's a fine distinction about pHs that I don't think is made for us as gardeners. Right, right. So yeah. we, we either have to learn from experience or you know, just not have that plant, as you said. 
Yeah, yeah. That's why I kind of could call it like that rule of thumb, that right, you know, right plant, right place, because it's kind of like our best guess. But there's so many other little factors that we don't know about. There may be some soil organism that it needs some back, you know, bacteria or fungus or something, or some, you know, other plant in the vicinity that we don't know about yet. Oh, like so that, lady slippers, right? Like they've yeah, just recently yeah. been work, looking into lady slippers, which you just can't dig up and move because they live in that whole um, mycorrhiza population of the plants mm -hmm. with them and you can't extract them and transplant them. Right, yeah. right. So yeah. There's a question in the chat for you. Mm -hmm. um, can you plant just one shrub or is it best to plant them in groups? Um, it's best to plant them in groups. I mean, you can plant just one and, um, you know, it may not uh, like um, produce as much fruit, you know, and stuff because it may not get like pollinated as well. Most plants are don't like to self pollinate. So it's better to plant them in groups. And then the more you plant group plants together, the more they are like forming a nice like um, environment in the soil. Um, you know, for soil organisms um, and, you know, like we found that that the more th plants are together, it actually increases the diversity of, we were just talking about the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so planting things in groups definitely is better, though the plant will certainly survive if it's planted individually, but it's always better, you know, even if you don't plant the shrub, if you can't get another shrub in there to plant it with some underlying herbaceous plants or something. So it's not just like kind of on its own. And you also get more wildlife and, you know, more um, ecosystem value if you are able to partner it with other plants. But, you know, if you only have room for one, it's certainly better than none. Um, so go for it. But I have a question about, I'm going to interrupt here. Hi, it's, it, thank you very much, by the way, for the excellent presentation. Again, Mark, yours are always just spectacular. Um, I had a question about watering. You had the slide that said you should water uh, any new shrubs for a year, but that's, I don't think it's necessarily excessive because we've planted some things and they haven't survived. So I'm assuming it's because we're not watering sufficiently. Um, but that's not the information that's ever given out when when buying plants. You now they're like, you know, water it a lot for X amount of time, but they don't say in fact they're somewhere. Um, it, it doesn't say you know, like give it bucket, buckets and buckets of water once a week for a year. Um, so I'm concerned that we're not ever going to water things sufficiently. Right. I mean, you certainly want to, um, you know, I think I said water at least for a year, or keep your eyes on, you know, be, until it's established, depending how big the shrub was and, you know, how it's planted and all that stuff. But yeah, no, that's a good point that, um, you know, I mean, a good nursery will give you a sheet that explains that. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, times I see that information, but it's not necessarily, they're not necessarily telling you when you buy it, unless they give you that sheet. But yeah, it's definitely shrubs take you know, like one to three years to get established. And, you know, the ideal precipitation, you know, is usually like during the warm months, about um, an inch of rain a week. And so that's about how much you want to do it. You think of the surface area of the roots and how much water it would take to cover that. And um and then I go with it. These are just kind of going backwards by themselves. I'm not doing that. <laughs> not right that's what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so I'm, I'll, I'll, yeah, sorry. But I, I agree with you about the about the inch a week. So if you have a rain gauge, it's really easy to tell. You just mm -hmm. reset it every weekend. And if it gets up close to an inch by the next weekend, you're okay. And if it doesn't, um, I take one gallon of water per tree seedling and I drive them up my driveway, fill the entire car with gallon jugs mm -hmm. because either that or I'm going to lose them. So I think it's worth the work, even though it is a ton of work. And Mark, you're walking, I don't know how you get water through your woods <laughs> um, on your backpack, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think trees and, yeah. and any kind of good shrub mm -hmm. needs a gallon of water a week if it doesn't get an inch. And if it, gets, if it rains half an inch a week, then you give the tree the other half of the gallon or something like that. Okay. So they take yeah. water to get so, established. I have one more question about uh, red twig and yellow twig dogwoods as understory 
trees in an oak and hickory forest. Mm. Will they work well? We've just planted two, I think. Two red twigs. Two red yeah, they, twigs. we live in really like wetter, sunnier areas. So I think that's probably going to be a stretch for them. I mean, I have mine in like, you know, full sun in, in wetter areas. I'm kind of just looking to see what their range is here. Um, you know, whether they, but they generally want the moist full sun, um, you know, or well-drained full sun. So I don't think they're really going to do well in sort of like drier shade. They'll, I mean, they could survive once they're established, but they'll probably be pretty spindly and won't really bloom that much. The one's right on the edge. Okay. Well, we may have to move them quickly next year then before they get really big. All right. Thank you. Okay, and then just to real go back real fast to the watering thing, we were talking about watering shrubs. Another thing you can do for that is take a gallon container, like a milk gallon container, poke a pinhole in the bottom, fill it with water and set it there. And it'll just slowly drip. So you don't have to stand there with a hose or you know, wait and pull a <laughs> bucket of water. And with my larger trees, I use a five gallon bucket and I just drill a hole about eighth of inch di uh, diameter at the bottom and just fill that and set it out next to the tree. And it takes a couple hours, but it's a nice slow watering. And then I don't have to stand there with the uh, the hose. And I can take those out into the woods on my little um, garden cart. Okay, yep. great. That actually is a great idea. Thank you very much. Okay. Len had had one more follow-up and you might have answered it, but um, what would be the minimum number of plants if that you would recommend for a shrub planting? For, I always like to do things in at least threes, you know, like I just like, um, you know, because I'm also thinking of, you know, if there's a failure. So then like, you know, if you only have two and then one dies then you know, you've got one just like on its own. So I, I always like to have sort of that redundancy built in of having, you know, at least three. But again, like I said, if you only have room for one, it's better than no shrub and it. If you take care of it, it's going to grow, you know, um, but they'll grow better and um, you'll have more diversity if you plant um, more than one. And, you know, and if they're within the same species, you'll get better cross pollinization. So I, in terms, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Susan. I was just going to say I have um, I firmly believe in trying to plant plant communities all at once to get everything to establish their roots all together. But my mm -hmm. challenge becomes thinking about the future, knowing that if I'm putting in a whole plant community of trees, shrubs, and herbaceous things underneath that, that the shrubs I'm choosing, thinking long-term are going to want more shade. However, the tree that I'm planting is not going to provide that shade. How mm -hmm. do you recommend maneuvering that, um, picking your combination of plants, knowing that the shade is going to change over time. Yeah. What I tend to do, I, I like, um, I tend to, uh, like say, so for the trees, you know, I space them out what I think their mature height. I usually go like about for a canopy tree, about, you know, 20 feet apart and then intersperse with the shrubs and stuff. And I initially start with, um, cause most Canopy trees will grow, you know, like, you know, in full sun, you know, including as younger ones. As long yeah. as they're past the seedling stage, they can go in that full sun. And most shrubs will also go in full sun. So that initial thing, I go with um, things, everybody that likes full sun, including the herbaceous. So I don't try to get my woodland herbaceous in until the shade has been formed already by these shrubs or the trees. So I try to get at least a few fast growing trees in there and some fast growing shrubs. So I'll get my shade as quickly as possible. And then once I start getting some shade, so I know it's gonna be succession. I know those sunny herbaceous things or sunny woody things, you know, short lived shrubs are going to die, but it's gonna take 10 or 20 years for the trees to get that big to provide so much shade that the shrubs aren't gonna last. 
the herbaceous will go sooner, but they're easier to replace. So a lot of times I don't put much money into the herbaceous, you know, because I know it's going to like be dying out in, you know, as soon as the shade starts forming. So a lot of times I'll start that from seed or whatever, or let whatever's there stay, even if it's like, you know, some non-natives come in as long as they're not, if they're like annual or herbaceous, and I think they're going to die out when it gets full shade, I'll remove them if I have time, but I don't worry about that much because they're going to die in the short term, you know, as soon as enough shade comes in. So did that kind of answer your question, Jesse? Yeah, it did. And it, okay. it points to that, you know, looking at it over a, a timeline, what to focus on first. So yeah, because each of those stages of succession has value to wildlife. You know, there are birds, insects, et cetera, that want the early successional, that want the mid successional and the late. So each of those stages is good for wildlife. You know, so, you know, um, so that's another way to think of it. And then you enjoy the change, the change in the plants and the change in the wildlife as it goes along. Right, for sure. Uh, Donna asked, has anyone tried to grow button bush from seed? Mm -hmm. I think that that is definitely one that takes to cutting well, um, but I don't know about seed propagation. I, I've seen seed propagated button bush, but I've never tried to do it myself. So I don't know how difficult it is. That's one good thing about the Doug Kalina books is that he will talk about that kind of thing um, in the, you know, when cultivating, you know, this book, um, this is the old edition. Um, then uh, the, he does talk about that kind of stuff. And I'm sure if you Google it, you can um, find other sources also. Right. Awesome. Mark, I wanted to follow up on Glenn's question about how many shrubs are required. If the homeowner thinks that they have room for only one or a couple of shrubs, can they space them out over the yard? They don't have to plant three all in the front bed or three all around the back patio. Can they, can they put them one here, one there, one the other place? Oh yeah, it depends what their goals are. If we're talking about like, you know, three shrubs of the same species, you definitely want to have them where they're going to be able to pollinate one another. So, you know, if, if they're insect pollinated, you know, then make sure that, you know, like they're within, you know, like distance. So generally the average home yard, it's probably close enough. If they're wind yeah. pollinated, you want to make sure like that the building or something's not blocking the um, the wind going back from another for the strongest po um, pollination, pollinization. But yeah, you can certainly space them around the yard. Again, you know, if they're closer together enough that, you know, eventually their roots will intertwine or the, the branches, that's ideal. But, you know, where there are a lot of other factors at play than just that, you know, people have to consider the use of their yard, aesthetics, available room, available sunlight and stuff. So there are a lot of other factors. So yes, it is all right to space them around. Okay, thanks. Okay. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Um, for another wonderful presentation, we look forward to be able to provide all of those resources to people on um, the recording and our other our website and things we link to. And um, and if anybody hasn't checked out Mark's uh, website, it is just chock full of resources. So check that out for sure. Um, I'm going to have. Yeah, I'll stop. For sharing. Okay. Yeah. I I like have full power here. I get to do it wow. even if you don't want me to. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Jesse. I know. I'm power <laughs> tripping over here. Uh -huh. I get to control the screen. Okay. So um, on to the rest of our chapter business. Um, our finances are very well situated to do a lot of good in the coming year. Um, we have a little almost two and a half thousand dollars that we want to put into plants into the ground. Um, I believe that we have recently made connection with a group that may be looking to fill out the application to get a grant from us to use some of that money for plants on their property. Uh, that grant application is available on our website. Um, so hopefully we can get that approved and get some plants in their hands. The only pending amount that isn't taken off of that balance yet is our donation to Little Blue Stem for Ben's presentation last month. And he had reached out to say that 
he was part of a um um like a donation doubling effort so that our donation was going to be matched by another organization to you know make their money grow even faster so that was great to hear uh the big business tonight is our elections for our uh board of directors and our officers um i don't know if anybody else got notification but I, nobody reached out to me to say hey i'm really dying to do this great work with you uh so that is unfortunate and that means that uh, we will only have myself susan and Denise as officers. Um, I don't know what that's going to mean for us for actually rechartering for 2023. I believe that we have to have all of our positions filled, um, at least those top four positions. I don't think the membership chair has to be filled to recharter. So. Jesse, I'm pretty sure that we have to have only three officers, but we might have to have a membership chair, but that can be done by another officer except the president. Right. I because, think that the three you have that, too much work already. I thought the three that we had that we needed were actually I thought we president, needed president, president, secretary, and treasurer. Those are the three we need. Okay. I well, then, so. yeah. congratulations. We can recharter next year. Um, yeah, but so. we, want, but we want more help. So Can you say what the duties of the membership chair are again? Oh yeah, look at that. This is um these are the explanations of each of the roles. So I've been doing the membership chair duties for the last couple of years. Um, and it basically entails when we do tabling events and we talk to all these great people and they're interested and they want to start hearing more about us or get the link to the meetings they put down their email address so that gets added into a spreadsheet so that every month they are now on the list to get our link for our meeting and then our newsletter so we send mostly most months we send two emails uh those are the two and besides that it is when we get a new member which national lets us know when we have a new member uh we have a chapter email that we send them that says just about our chapter. Um, we do not go after people to remind them that their memberships are expiring or um, do anything like that. National takes care of dues and they send out multiple emails about memberships expiring. So really the only things that the membership chair are doing for us are keeping track of sending that new member email and making sure that the invitation for the meeting gets to, right now it goes out to over 600 people. So over the last two years, we've grown our um, email list to over 600, which is very exciting. Uh, That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's just a touch disappointing that then we only get like 30, 35 people at our meetings. But I think that that speaks to the fact that we have our YouTube channel and people can prioritize the things they need to do and come back to us when they need to. And we are a resource there. So um, they're missing out on some of the great conversations that we have real time, but they're getting the information, which is the important part. And I think as you pointed out, Jesse, the membership chair does not have to maintain the roster of members. National does that. If you need it, you just go to the website, click download and it's there. Yep. So, to me, that was a really egregious part of being a membership coordinator is keeping track of all those names, addresses, and phone numbers, and you don't have to do that. Mm -mm. National does it all. No, it, it, they make that part very easy. Uh, just the, and the input for after tabling events is really, you know, like an hour or so, and then that's done for, you know, the ne until the next time we have a tabling event. It, it's, yeah. of the roles, it's, it's not. That it's timely. probably the most flexible. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and it's there's whatever. not a lot of timely things about it except for you know getting the the link out for the meeting, which this this time I think you guys got it two days ago, right? Because that's right. Really that's to get it. So, Judy, are you thinking about that? Are you uh, interested? Yes, I was going to say if you'd like to put my name down on the slate for membership chair. Wonderful. I would. Yes, thank you. Able to I'm, do that. 
very excited about that. That's fantastic. Okay, so we've had a nomination. Where am I going? Oh my gosh, I'm giving all the way secrets away. <clears throat> okay. So that's very exciting. Thank you, Judy. I look forward to um, passing the torch of that part over to you. Um, and any of these other positions, if anybody's ever interested, if, if you're not ready now, because I know everything comes in seasons and I wouldn't have been able to do the things that I've done with the chapter before now. Um, and there's coming a time where I'm not going to be able to do as much with the chapter as I have in the past. If you are moving into a different season and want to take on one of these roles, just reach out. We, we're not so bad to hang out with for sure. <laughs> so Jesse, before you move, um, we did, aren't we, don't we need to have the election? Oh, we do. I, yeah, um, okay. That's okay. So we have 28, we have 25 people on right now. Um, All we need is a majority of the attendees. Perfect. I think everybody has the ability to raise their hand, right? Isn't that part of the Zoom? Um, yeah, it's actually easier if you just ask for any uh, nay votes because that's usually much smaller. But you, you okay, can do it yeah. way. If anybody thinks we are doing a terrible job and you can do better, uh, we would love you to say nay. And then. Uh, well, let's have the election for the board of directors first. Can you put that slide back? I would can. you mind? Just with the four names? I can if it listens to me. Right. Here we go. Because, okay, so it's you, Marilyn, Denise, and me for the board. Unless anyone else is interested, which would be most welcome. Um, yeah. Judy, are you interested in joining the board as well? And you can say no, that's fine. Uh, well, let me tell you what the board does. Basically, we get together a few times a year between like every two to four months. I'll oh, randomly yeah. say, hey guys, it's been a while since we talked. We should really figure some stuff out. And we um, either meet in person or we'll meet via Zoom and we come up with the next several months plans, things that we are hoping to do, things that we want to do. And we are guiding the chapter in, in how we want it to run and how we, what the things we want to provide. The um, issue that we've come into is we've had so many great ideas and tons of things that we've gotten um, either started or uh, dreamed about, but then we don't always have the boots on the ground to be able to make those activities come to life. However, without the board, we, we don't even have a plan. Um, so step one is coming up with the ideas. Step two is wrangling people in to then make those great ideas happen. Uh, so the, the four of us and Audrey had been on the board up until now currently. So the things that we've been able to do over the last two years is, is mostly because of the things that we've been able to dream up. So is anyone else interested in uh, being on the board or thinking about it for next year is fine too. Well, Rick just, Rick just asked a question too. Sorry? Yeah, the number is flexible, Susan's right. There's no set amount of board members. Um, the, the officer roles have to be set and we, we talked about those three minimum more are better, but the board of directors, there's no set number. I want to say somewhere in the paperwork, it says that there's some type of a ratio of board of directors to the amount of people you have in your chapter, almost like representation, but I, I can't direct that to you at the moment. I throw right, my the new bylaws require. Board. So Rick, would you like to be part of the board? Yes, please. Yes, please. And as okay. would I. And Judy, oh guys, thank you so much for wanting to help us make this better. I love Meetings it. Meetings just can't be the same night as my banquet planning meetings. Um, you'll have to tell me that. And it's you. We're very flexible because um, I work so much that I'm usually like, hey, I have this day off, guys. Could we do it then? And we make it work. Um, and it's not. We we've been able to do a lot with just throwing it together um, as we go. So we will make it work. Right, there's no set meeting date. Um, Jesse sends around an invite or sometimes I do and everybody responds with their availability. So not to worry about, about being locked out. We, we work for a date that everybody is available. 
Okay, so the nominations for board are now um, Jesse Schiffler, Marilyn Smith, Denise Everett, um, Susan Coughlin, me, Rick Smith, and Judy Blaylock. Anyone else um, is free to nominate themselves if they'd like to? Okay, why don't I close the nominations and then I'll call for a vote. I think it's easier to ask for if there are any no votes on the board or any individual member of the board. Anybody put up their hand if they have a no vote for that for the board slate. Jesse, do you see hands on your screen? I don't. Um, All I see is chat. Why don't, why don't we put it in the chat? Because I don't see hands. No, I saw something pop up that said Judy raised her hand, but that was the only thing okay. that I saw, and I don't see that now. So, yeah. Yeah, on some, some Zooms, unless you raise your hand. People might not know how to do it. Down at the bottom, there's a little, I can't, I have a cat on my lap, so I cannot get the screen any closer to me, but it says reactions. Mm -hmm. So if you click where it says reactions, you can do clap, oh, thumb, yeah. heart, smiley face, a little ta-da. You know, and then who sees it? Can do. Uh, I okay. Can so my own, raise hand is there. Yeah, raise hand is there. So if anybody, everyone should right, if anybody has an objection, raise your hands. So Rick, you have a hand on your screen. Go ahead. He was practicing. I was practicing. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so seeing no hands, I'm going to. Great. Yeah, seeing no hands, I'm going to declare that the slate is approved. Good. Okay. Um, then we have election for officers. So I've been involved at the national level in preparing um, national bylaws that are going to be rolled out to every chapter next year, which means we don't have to invent bylaws. We just have them given to us. But the bylaws say that the officers are appointed by the board. And this is something that chapters can decide, no, we want to elect our own officers. And so far, that's been what this chapter does. So we can, um, we can do it the way national is going to suggest and let the board appoint the officers, or we can just have an election for the officers who are up there right now and the members present at the meeting can vote. I so Jesse, do you, since we've just been voting, we continue just voting at this it point. Seems, yeah, it seems better to me. Okay, so the officer slate is President Jesse Schiffler. Yay. Vice President, we do not have anyone. If someone wants to self-nominate, um, raise your hand now and we'll be that'll be most welcome. Whoops. Oh yeah. Treasurer I, Denise Everett. No, that's okay. Um, I, I should know yours. these things. Secretary, me, Susan. And membership chair, um, Judy Blaylock. So are there any other nominations for officer? My screen is showing me nothing. I just wanted to show you the vice president um, responsibilities oh, okay. there, uh, if anybody is considering that. Yeah, that's really small. Um, Somebody won. <laughs> Sorry, that's my phone. Oh. <laughs> and, and the vice president is, it's a really flexible um, position too. And Audrey just, I think on her own, or maybe we encouraged her to do it, is, is doing, her husband doing the thought of the month and the tree of the month every meeting, which is not part of the duties of the vice president, but just something that Audrey felt like she wanted to do and was fantastic. And maybe she'll keep doing it, I don't know. Um, but it's not something the vice president would have to do, but it has been most welcome. And I think a really nice feature of the meetings and the newsletters. But that's not part of the requirements in case anybody's worried about that. Okay, any nominations for vice president? I'm not seeing any, so I'll close the floor. And um, the officers, I, as I just announced them, that's the slate for officers. Anybody object to the officers or any one of them, please put up your hand on the screen the way Judy taught us. Thank you, Judy. And seeing no hands, Jesse, do you see any hands? I've got two screens up, but it doesn't mean I see everything. See no hands. I don't see any hands. Okay, great. The slate of officers is approved. Thank you everyone very much. And Judy, welcome. Awesome. Okay, guys. Now on to the fun stuff. Yeah, sorry about that. No, it's we have to do it. No. But um, Audrey, if we still have you, I'd love it if you could share our thought of the month. Yep, I am still here. Um, and I think we yes, have- I will. We have wrangled you into continuing to do this. Right? <laughs> I was just going to say, yes, I'm happy to continue um, 
researching content and writing it. If anybody, I mean, I'll still do it if nobody wants to do it, but I'm not the best public speaker. So if anybody wants to take on that, I'm happy to feed you the information and you guys can spit it out. <laughs> yeah. And I never mind doing that either guys. So don't, don't worry about that. Okay. So this month we're thinking about light pollution. Um, humans love to light up the night, whether it's a city, suburbia, or the middle of nowhere, you can find outside lights left on all night. Some are so bright that you might be confused and think the sun has risen. But what effect does this have on people and animals? As we talked about last month, many migratory birds are killed when they fly into the windows of our homes and workplaces. Bright lights make this problem worse as they throw off the navigation of birds who often migrate at night. Light pollution can alter the vocal communication of birds as well. When I lived in Phoenixville, I often heard songbirds communicating in the middle of the night. And you can imagine that if they are out at that hour, they are easy targets for animals that could prey upon them. Also, the breeding season of birds is skewed in areas with a lot of artificial light at night. Some birds have been found to lay their eggs a month earlier than normal, resulting in chicks being born early before there is a large enough supply of food. Many insects are drawn toward light and will exhaust themselves by daybreak hovering around lights. Insect mating is disrupted by light. And we already know that less insects means less birds. The nighttime croaking of frogs and toads is part of their breeding ritual. This is disrupted by artificial light. Baby sea turtles who have just hatched are wired to head toward the moon over the ocean, but get disoriented and instead go towards the bright lights of the homes and businesses along the coastline. The whole world is rocked for nocturnal animals when night becomes day. Artificial lighting harms people as well. It disrupts sleep, potentially leading to health problems and impaired functioning in the daytime. For those of us that love dark nights, it takes a toll on emotional health as well. We need to get back in balance with Mother Earth and her rhythms. Everything is connected. Let's first do no harm. We can all appreciate the beauty of a landscape lit up at night, but is it worth it? And as Christmas approaches, many of us will put extra lights on the exterior of our homes. Please consider using a timer so these lights do not stay on all night. If you have lights for security reasons, try motion sensors. That way the light is only on if you need it to be. Other suggestions include using lights that are shielded and facing down and using bulbs with a red or yellow tint as their long wavelengths are less visible to most animals. We can also educate our neighbors and try to make our neighborhoods and communities darker at night like it's supposed to be. Embrace the beauty, the beautiful darkness. It's just the absence of light and equally important for life. Well said, well said. Um, I have a couple of extra thoughts of the month this time because um, Marilyn sent us this great article about plants, protecting plants using essentially nurse plants, um, which I've, I've done and I didn't really know that it was a thing. I just thought, oh, I wonder if this will work. Um, so if you get emails or updates or follow the Humane Gardener. She has wonderful tips to share, but it's basically talking about using herbaceous or uh, understory plants to protect more vulnerable tree saplings or um, more tasty morsels for different things. Uh, she uses pokeweed, she uses all sorts of things. I've been known to use mint to protect other saplings from herbivory. Uh, so this is a great article that I thought everybody could take a little something from and try and apply it to your landscape so that you can protect some of your uh, more tender plants from whether that be from deer or from rabbits or whatever the critter is that you're trying to protect from. And we also uh, wanna share Pennsylvania Governor's Invasive Species Council news. They have a survey happening right now 
um, everyone fill out the survey, include recommendations for a buyback program to get banned ornamentals out of the system instead of continuing to be sold for two more years. Susan's going to speak to us a little bit about this and what's going on, but the deadline is fast approaching to get this survey in. Um, Sunday, November 13th is the deadline. Um, Jesse, I think you said just about everything. Um, the Department of Agriculture is the department that runs the Committee on Noxious Weeds, which actually passes the law that bans invasive plants. Um, they work a lot with invasive weeds and agricultural pests and recently have been encouraged by groups like Wild Ones and the Pennsylvania Native Plant Society to work on banning invasive ornamental plants, which is, is probably more what we're concerned about. Things like calorie pear, um, Japanese barberry, euonymus, those plants that used to be planted as ornamentals and have escaped into the wild. And now they are colonizing and taking over a lot of areas in Pennsylvania, everything from roadsides into the woodlands and fields. And they cost a lot of money to remove. Obviously, as Mark pointed out, these non-natives don't provide anything more than the most basic ecosystem services, a little bit of shelter, um, if they provide food, sometimes their seeds are part of the problem because the birds will spread them um, when they eat them. So it benefits everyone to get these invasives out of the Pennsylvania ecosystem, which of course costs money, and out of the supply system. And this is where um, the idea for a buyback program came. Nurseries, obviously, that propagate these plants are making money on them. They don't really want to lose that money. So they have been given a two-year phase-in period when each of these invasive ornamentals is banned, meaning from the date that the, um, the Noxious Weed Committee bans the plant, that's fine. But the nurseries have two more years to propagate and sell everything that they've got on their inventory, which means two more years of you want winged euonymus and Japanese barberry and bush honeysuckle and all these other plants showing up on Home Depot lots and every place else and continuing to be purchased and planted, which is detrimental to our ecosystem. So the idea is if the nurseries can realize their otherwise lost profits, a buyback program would, would pay the nurseries the value of these plants and burn them. And so they won't enter the supply chain and they won't be planted for two more years and they won't go out there and increase the problem. Um, and that of course costs money. So one of the questions in the survey is um, what would additional funding be used for? And we encourage everybody to um, consider putting down there a buyback program because it makes more sense to keep the plants out of the system than to have to go and remove them, which costs money either way. So we're just asking everybody, um, all, all of the Wild Ones chapters in Pennsylvania and other organizations are asking their members to um, go online on the SurveyMonkey website, fill out the survey of your experiences with these invasive ornamentals or other invasive plants, including weeds, um, you know, out in the wild or in your yard, and then suggestions for, um, for funding. I have a request for those of us that are lazy um, instead of us having to go into the slides, could you email out the link to the survey? I, I wouldn't consider it a, a, an annoying email. I'd be very happy to click it. We can do that, right, Jesse? We can just forward Chris's email. We, we probably can. We also have it up on, you put it on the web page, right? On our website? Uh, it's on Facebook. On it's Facebook. on the Facebook page. So oh, it's on okay. Facebook. It's also in the chat right now if you want to copy that link. And um, that was Rick's great idea. So that link is in there and you can follow that after the meeting. Um, I can I can try oh God, I'm already out there. Thank you. Awesome. It is a good idea, Judy. I'm just not as timely as you would think I could be at sending out um, emails, especially with such a short turnaround time and the fact that I'm going to crash and burn right after this meeting. Um, <clears throat> The next, so everybody do this. Um, it it's a I, I, from what Susan was telling us, the survey is a little uh, takes like 15, 20 minutes, but it, it seems to be geared more towards maybe not private landowners. But the more people they hear from, the more data they have to say. People are thinking about this. This is detrimental. Let's work on it. Right. I don't even think it takes that long. It asks you for your experience with three different invasive species. And you don't have to um, list all three. If you don't have three, you just click into next. And then it goes into, um, has funding been available for you? What would you spend the money on if you had it? 
And that's where we're suggesting a buyback program would be a useful suggestion. Excellent, thank you. And then um, I, I, a little friendly reminder, I'm sure everybody that's still on here is definitely leaving your leaves and you're telling your neighbors to leave your leaves. But as someone who has a neighbor who will run his gas powered leaf blower for mm. hours and hours every day, mm. regardless of daytime or nighttime, regardless of raining or sunshine. Um, I found this article to be wonderful. It is um, full of foul language, which is right up my alley. So if you don't like foul language, don't click the link. Um, but it, it's very eloquently written with lots of great reasons why you should not be using your gas powered leaf blower. Um, so if you wanna peek into my I'm gonna go on that. terrible mind, um, that link that link will give you a All good right. idea. Well, and they are noisy. Um, I think uh, California has banned gas powered lawn equipment of any kind as of 20 something or other. Um, right. yeah. days in period. Um, and some municipalities, I think maybe Ardmore, have also banned the use of gas-powered um, lawn equipment because it is so noisy. So they're trying to segue transition into using the battery-powered or the electric, which are quieter. Yep. It, it doesn't it's, fix the neighbor running it 24 hours a day, I'm sorry to say, but... It's just soul-sucking. Like you... Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely hard. Yeah, I'm really sorry that you... Yeah. So you're so, facing that. Um, should be winter soon, and he should have battled all of the leaves, and then that should be better. Uh, poor we, leaves. I mean, poor little critters. They I know. It's so leaves. sad. So yeah. sad. I will say that since we live in the woods, in our our drive, we have a, a semi-circle driveway, circular driveway, whatever, half circle. We have to do something to get the leaves off of the the driveway itself because otherwise you can't see to drive into the driveway out there. and we had like eight inches of leaves out there so George does occasionally throw the leaves but he does it as little as possible and he blows them into the woods we don't bag anything up right but there's you know a, it would not be safe in the rain for us to have eight inches of wet leaves on the drive. Yeah, and and this article um, does speak to something like that also. Oh, so, good. Um, yeah, there's definitely a yeah. time and place for sure. And you can still rake the leaves. I spent yesterday raking my 500 foot driveway in the woods, which also gets covered with leaves. Right. But I just push them off to one side and there they are. And I know some people are um, not as able-bodied as others. I totally get it. There is, this this man is definitely not one of those instances. <laughs> However, um, there are people that are, and I get it that some people may need to do this, but the majority of people definitely do not. And the battery powered option is still going to be better. They're so, quieter, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, moving on. I, I digress. Um, we have our tree of the month. Audrey, do we still have you with us? Yeah, yeah. Um, also, I just want to quickly say, if there's anything that um, anybody is interested in having me research for the thought of the month or tree of the month, um, please do just let us know. Um, I just kind of arbitrarily pick these or take great ideas from the rest of the board. Um, but you know, I'd love to know what you guys are wondering about, and I will look it up for you. So please just let us know. Uh, so our tree of the month is American holly, or Ilex opaca. The American holly is a medium-sized evergreen tree that can be found in the woodland understory of the eastern United States. In cultivation, typical height is about 50 feet. It's a tree worth consideration as a specimen tree as a hedge or for screening and sound reduction in your garden. It's beautiful and interesting in all seasons and a valuable tree for wildlife. Plus, hollies tolerate pruning well, so you'll always have a supply for your Christmas decorating. 
Its small white flowers bloom in spring with a mild fragrance attracting butterflies and bees. American holly is the host plant for Henry's elfin butterfly. A male plant is required nearby for small red berries or droops to form on female trees in the fall. The berries persist through winter, feeding song and game birds and small mammals. Uneaten berries contain seeds to propagate the species. Evergreen leaves are thick and spiny. Leaf drop occurs in spring with emergent new leaves, which start out light green and become darker and leathery through the summer. Hollies have pretty light gray and smooth bark. Trunk cavities can provide nesting sites for birds. The American holly has a pyramid form and dense low branching, another reason it works well for screening. It's a slow grower, but can live to be over 200 years old. Full sun is best for berry production, but again, in nature, hollies are understory trees, so they are shade tolerant as well, albeit with less berries and less density than in full sun. And actually, Mark just talked about this. Though American holly is tolerant of occasional flooding and drought, it prefers moist, well-drained, and slightly acidic soil, although now we know that maybe that's not really the case. Um, don't have room for the holly tree? How about trying winterberry holly or inkberry holly shrubs instead? Winterberry is deciduous with pretty bark and red berries, and inkberry is evergreen with blackberries. All three would make beautiful and valuable additions to your garden. Thank you, Audrey. I thought that was a wonderful and timely um, tree of the month for sure. Thank you. Uh, we are on to the last section of our meeting, upcoming opportunities. I want to thank Rita for sending us all of these. Um, there are less opportunities through the colder months of the year, but still great to check out. Uh, there's lots of online things typically through those colder months. This is listed by the um, organization and then the dates are underneath of it. We'll have these available through the recording in our newsletter and um, on our website then also. Mount Cuba is doing some great things. Redbud has their annual marketplace. We were, Justin and I were um, part of the first winter market that they had uh, and it was a cute collection of vendors who were selling things you know for Christmas gifts and things like that, but they did have um, experiences. You could make your own evergreen uh, cuttings and decorations, and they had some plants for sale at that time also. This is, if you are in the Phoenixville area, this is a great event that is happening uh, this Sunday, November 13th. Um, Planet Local, A Quiet Revolution. It's happening at the Colonial Theater. You have to register for it, but there will be a panel discussion afterwards talking about um, local economies and ecosystems and um, the globalization kind of revolution and the problems with that. So it's a fascinating topic. I hope that a lot of people are able to attend. New directions in the American landscape. Maybe a lot of you got an email through Wild Ones because they are co-partnering with this conference, um, or it's it's a course, it's coursework through all of these dates with Larry Weiner, who is a local guy who specializes in native plant ecosystems, and uh, it's it's a very expensive course, but I would really love to take it. I looked ahead and I work half of the days that it's there. I know that you can, you'll get access to the recordings and it is all virtual except for like that one um, office hours. So if I wanted to devote the money to it, I, you can, um, you know, attend real time, the ones you can make and watch the recordings of the others. I'm sure that it is packed full of information that would be applicable to both large and small scale um, landscapes. And there's also a 
password protected textbook or, or course material that you get access to with this course. So I highly recommend it if you have the ability to, to do that. Unfortunately, I didn't see any Wild Ones membership discounts. That would have been nice. Uh, and this is another thing. If you are in the Chester County area on Facebook, Noreen has said that it would be okay if I tell all of our members about it. They're having a native plant seed swap or the focus is on native plants. There may be other plants there that are not native, but the focus is native. Um, it's at her house. She has several events like this throughout the year. They do a plant swap. They do um, a different seed swap a different time of the year, their regular seed swap in February and March. Uh, but the address is there. The Chester County Ramblings Gardening Group is a private group on Facebook, but you can request to join it. It's mostly focuses on gardening in general, not just natives. I do sneak on there and post lots of native plant stuff um, to sprinkle in with people's traditional gardening information. But um, I think this would be a great event if you're able to. If you have seeds that you would like to contribute, you can get on there and let them know. I also think you can just show up with your seeds and it's kind of a very free flow. You don't have to have it planned, what you're bringing, what you're um, gonna swap with. Uh, she is also having, they do pottery on their property. And I think there's a pottery sale that day also. So. If that's something that interests you or you want to try and diversify your seed options, check that out. We have discussed, the board has discussed this um, Keystone 10 Million Trees partnership. We have the access and availability to get free trees through the Keystone 10 Million Trees partnership for people to be able to put on their properties. And what we've come up with uh, if you want between one and 10 trees, find a buddy, you know, whether it be your neighbor or a chapter member um, to come up with those trees and then send your list to Susan and we will pick up those trees for you. If you want 11 to 19 um, trees, same thing, but they're just your property. So it's your list. You're going to email Susan. We're going to collate all of the trees that you want and then we'll get them and the pickup will be at my house. If you have a large property or a project that you're doing in your community that you want trees for, it's 20 trees or more, email Corey directly. Um, that's at this email address. And note the deadlines for contacting. It's the number of trees and shrubs. She would like the list in the common name um, the location of the planting and how many of each species you want. The trees come with stakes, tubes, and bird netting, so you can protect these plantings. Um, here is the list of the available species. There's so many great things on there. There is an asterisk by the softwoods because she wanted to remind us that softwoods, especially when they're in these smaller stages are much more susceptible to failure. And therefore, if you're planning a project, maybe make sure you're planning for less of those in case there is a lot of failure and your whole project doesn't go down the hill. Um, but that's- and Corey, Corey also noted that um, they frequently have to substitute because they don't have enough. Uh, this program covers multiple counties. And so the requests are just huge. And if they run out of something, um, they just substitute. So it, it's good to to plan, but to have flexibility. Every yeah. time we've ordered, we've had subs, right, Jesse? We have had subs and there's something yeah. that weren't available that we had requested, um, but we've always gotten some things and they're of good quality. They're just small. They need a little bit of um, attention, but right. it's, definitely definitely, it's definitely worth it. Uh, I've had some failure. I've had some great successes. So, and for free trees, that means the only thing you're putting into it is the time to um, place the order and pick up the order. And other than that, you know, it's a, it's a great resource that we should try and take advantage of because like I always say, the more native plants in the ground, the better. That's 
you know, what we're doing here. And Jesse, could we have a deadline to submit requests um, to me? Um, what about uh, the day before Thanksgiving, the 23rd? Because the sooner we get our list into Corey, I think the better our chances of getting things. I think that that's right? fair. That's definitely okay. fair. Okay. And if anybody has any questions, um, either reach out tonight or by email, um, the sooner the better and get get your lists into Susan right before Thanksgiving. By the 23rd. By the 23rd. Right, and then I'll get it to Corey. And that will be in our newsletter and on our website so that you have, you know, you can refer back to that. Yeah, and one thing that Corey does request if you guys are gonna take advantage of the program is to please take pictures of your site before you plant the trees. And then again, after they are planted. That, that's a great point. Thank you, Audrey. Um, that way she can see the progress and the things that they're doing. And she probably has bosses that she has to report to where these things go and, and the, the impact they're making. She's also requesting volunteers to help organize the plants prior to pickup. And that will be on Friday, April 14th at 9 a.m. Last time we picked up plants from them, it was at the um, Red Clay Alliance down in outside of Westchester. I'm not sure if that's the same, going to be the same pickup location or not. It was a great place to pick up trees. So uh, if you have the availability and you know want to um, get your hands on a lot of plants. That's, that is the same place this year. She, she verified that. Oh, excellent. Um, We'll just have to see if it's at, over at the barn like it was the first time. Uh, or, uh, I think the letter said the barn, but I'll double check. Okay. And also, mm -hmm. if you want to volunteer, it's best to call her. And do we have her number? We have, we her, have email. her contact her email. information. Yeah. Please yeah. do consider volunteering, guys, because it, it's a lot of work for them. So we want to keep the program going. Um, it, it helps if we help. Right. It does. And I think we can walk away with your trees that day. So then oh, you would have to Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I wouldn't, I'm not going all the way down there to volunteer and not take my trees away with me. <laughs> there you go. No way. So I have a question about the last paragraph. It says, you are, if you're a new partner to K10, this is for a new location, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Contact me to set up a site visit. Does that mean she wants to go to people's? places to see where yeah, they so that's a, it's a good question judy it's a good question um but we kind of discussed that we as as a wild <coughs> chapter have gone through her previously so we're not necessarily considered the new partner and she okay. addressed the fact that most of our chapter members are have smaller projects that they're working on and she doesn't need to go to you know, a hundred million small yards to discuss the plants they're going to put in there. So she, that that's not something you need to do. If you would like technical assistance or information, you can definitely call her. Um, and she still wants the pictures of your projects, but she right. doesn't need to do a site visit. Okay. That's why I think it's better to order through the group because she does already know us um, and we just email her pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to work well. Yep. Right. Sounds like just a wonderful idea. Yeah, it is good. Especially for people that have um, a larger property that they're trying to uh, restore to more natural plant communities. Um, this is a way to get a lot of plants small when they're gonna do better um, with the protective gear included for free. So yeah, it's just a win-win. Do you have to be in Chester County? Um, no, no. Yeah. I'm in Montgomery County. Okay. Yeah. And it's um, the watershed versus the county specific. Um, okay. So yeah. Right. It was the Chesapeake Bay watershed last year. And that was problematic because that cuts out almost all of Montgomery County. But now they've expanded it to the Delaware and we are in the Dell. So now, now we're official. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Yay. And then I wanted to um, tell people about, I got the sign on the left um, for my yard a couple of years ago, and I really like it. I actually take it's it. So to, they're really great. Um, they're metal, they're high quality, well printed, sun resistant. Um, and I got an email. The reason I even bring this up is because I got an email about the sign on the right that it's apparently a new availability for him, um, which it 
feels to me like it's geared more to, towards the Midwest, but um, whatever you prefer, or if you like both or the orientation of the sign is important for the space you want. However, I just wanted to let you guys know this is an option that's out there. Um, it was created by some, I wanna say an entomology professor at some college, um, and then they did it as a fundraiser and it just kind of took off from there. His website has other things available for purchase, like um, high quality photographs that he's taken and things like that. But the signs, I know a lot of us are trying to do those cues for care and we don't always have um, just the right thing, but I thought these native habitat garden signs really point to the all of the important things that we're trying to do with our plantings. So that is um, something to look out for. Why do you think the one is skewed to the west of the country? It's the same bird. It, is, it, just, it felt more to me like the, uh, the um, it's like a prairie clover, or at least that's what it, it makes me think of. And that isn't necessarily yeah, like prairie clover. native here. Okay. Um, so, but to the Midwest, that's like kind of a, a keystone species there. So, okay. Well, the people wondering. driving by aren't going to know that. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> if Jesse drives <laughs> by, she will. <laughs> yes, you will. Excuse me, man. Your sign doesn't belong. <laughs> yeah. Your sign's not native. <laughs> Your sign's not native. That's good. I like that. Oh my god. Can I, if I if I carve it on stone with a chisel, is it native? <laughs> right, right. Only if you got it from your own bedrock. Um, okay, Which I did. <laughs> yeah, you would. You're like yeah, I know. away from <laughs> it. Quarry. Um, um, we have one meeting left in this year. It's been a crazy long year, huh? Um, and Susan, if I don't know if you've heard back from Susan about this, but if we just want to make sure and touch base that we are still on her radar to hear yeah. her wild seed collection mm -hmm. uh, for next month, that's going to be a great thing. Yes, it will. And um, then this is these are our nurseries. Most of our nurseries have kind of closed down for the season some of them were even extending um a couple of weeks because we had such warm weather but look for them again in the early spring i highly recommend if you're thinking and planning over the winter about um, ordering plants like from pollination you can put your orders in now their availability um goes down as it gets closer to spring and they will cue you uh like first come first serve when the plants are available so that you get your first options. Uh, and I will even start looking at places like Octorero and Northbrook over the winter for you know spring availability. So keep that in mind that you might not wanna wait till the first warm weekend in May to, if you're doing a big project to start looking for your plants uh, because people are thinking about it in December and January and getting their orders in. And with that, that's the blank screen of death. We're all. <laughs> are, are you going to remove the one in Quaker Town, the one closest to my house that closed, right? Oh, bummer. Which one? Um, Was it Archwild? Is that the one that closed? No, no. Archwild. Oh. Not. No, Northeast is, um, Natives. Northeast Natives. And I think that I took them off. Oh, of okay. Yeah, it is off. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah, I was sad to hear that they had that they had closed down. That was unfortunate. Jesse, I have a recommendation for that list. I discovered the garden shop at the Jenkins Arboretum, which is down in Wayne. It's fantastic. That's where Harold Sweetman worked for so many years, who started the Octorero Farm Nursery. Yeah. It is a fantastic garden shop. They did just um, close up for the winter, but they're, I just, I found their offerings really good. It's not huge, but the offerings were really varied. They're not 100% native. I would say about 90. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, also, I also came up with a, a, I just got some plants from a place called Direct Natives, which is in Maryland. And I think also Illinois or somewhere, but I can get you that website. And they're re they were really nice plants, beautifully um, packaged and everything. That sounds Ooh, great. Sounds I'd cool. love to add to the list. I will, I will, I'll get the website Wonderful. and send it to you. I don't know if, 
Yeah, he's not still on here, but I think we had been joined by a gentleman, um, a certified arborist who had requested the link to the meeting. So I hope um, that we were either speaking his language or taught him a new language about native plants to take with him to his business. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we would see. And maybe, maybe he could tell us about his business. Yeah, that would be about great. being an arborist. Yeah, and um, I just finished a class at Mount Cuba Center that was arboriculture, and it was so fascinating to hear from an arborist their, their thoughts and, um, you know, because their focus is trees where ours may be more plant community based. Um, it was a it was a great experience. I highly recommend it if you ever get the chance. Um, so that would be a great speaker to have at a future meeting, an arborist, especially one who is you know strongly native oriented. True, very true. Yeah, if we can find one. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, is there anything else that you're thinking, needing, wanting to share? Nope. Hope you feel better. Congratulations to the new board members and welcome. It's going to be a fun board meeting next time. Thanks for everybody's yes. help, too. Yes, thank you. Audrey, there were wonderful presentations, Audrey. Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> they were. Enjoyed you're the seed lot. collection time. And, and, so. and you thank too, you, Mark. Susan. That was spectacular. It is. <laughs> I think somebody was just saying something about seed collection. I said it's your what? seed collection time. I've got what do you have? Envelopes full. Of, let's see. I've got cardinal flowers, swamp milkweed, iris versicolor. Something I have pollinated my irises this year, so I've got. Ooh, that'll be a iris trick. Things. Yeah. There's um, a good. There's a good thing coming up with Brandywine, a, a, a Zoom thing about collecting seeds. And it was on your list, but it's, 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 I think it's Friday. Oh yeah. It's, you're right. It's Friday. Yep. Yeah. Ethical it, seed collection. Yeah. Uh, Rick, what, how long do you stratify your rose milkweed? Do you put them in like in January, put them out? I mean, I, or. I cold stratify everything and I just throw it out now. Okay. I direct so this time of year. Um, I figure I just as, keep it as close to nature as possible. Yeah, I've done a lot of mine this week, but I'm going to wait to January for some. I just wasn't sure. I don't have any luck at all with milkweed, and I'm looking for ways to improve on that. What kind, any specific kind of milkweed? All of them. I tried Verdus salata, I, or what's the V one? Veritas, something like that. I tried rose milkweed. I tried um, the standard butterfly milkweed. I've got Syriaca. Butterfly is have. hard. I think butterfly milkweed is hard. Is it tuberosa. I couldn't get anybody to germinate anything. And I, I just don't know why. Try because the other stuff came up. Do you know the milk jug method? Well, I use pots. I use four inch pots and coir. You know, I, I probably start 50 to 70 varieties of seed. So I don't I, understand why the milkweeds did not because most of the others did. I, I started them in the milk jug method last year and they worked fine. What's milk that? Jugs, yeah. Um, just go on and Google it. You'll see the, there's a YouTube okay. video on how to do it. It's really easy. I did milk uh, jug with butterfly last year and it was very successful. Really? Yeah, was it really? Oh gosh, yeah but you got to put it outside like, you know, December so that it freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws. And yeah, I was worried that the milk jugs would um, concentrate the heat a little bit and actually bake the little guys. So that's no. why I don't use it. No, huh. well, not a okay. problem. By okay, the time well, they germinate, like it's time for you to be planting. How deep is your soil level in the milk jugs? About four inches. Okay, and do you put um, breathing holes or uh, drainage holes in the bottom? Yes. Okay, I can do that. Okay, and I I'll use, give it a try. <laughs> I use um, organic mechanic seed starter soil. Okay, I use coir, but that's probably as long as it's porous and. Um, yeah, it has to be moist, and you have to have the lid off, and it's very. So easy. you don't cut the top of the milk jug off. You just literally no. take the lid off, and you're done. Yes. Okay, so do you? If you put them out now, do you watch them for drying out and water them? No. <laughs> oh. See, that's why I don't use milk jugs because I'm so worried that in that in enclosed environment they're going to dry out. Maybe you need to be more cash, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. 
swing it. You know, it, it's cheap. You know, just put a couple seeds in. See how yeah, it goes. Right. Yeah, what do you have free. to I'm, lose? Yeah, Stop I have being a helicopter parent, year. Susan. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know, Audrey? Have you been talking to my daughter? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> you you know, in seats, right? I, I definitely have my half gallon milk jug. <laughs> <laughs> I baby them all. I find nope. that the, the milk jug actually keeps them, it it holds on to the moisture a lot better than some other if things. If it doesn't escape. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, even like a other. terrarium, you know, like a terrarium. Right. What uh -huh. a good idea. I'll have to, I'll okay, have to thanks. search that one out. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Cindy. Yep. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure. I'm going to go. We need to okay, let Jesse, Jesse go. Thanks, everybody. Feel better, guys. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.